Good morning. Good morning. Uh, our speaker this morning is Harold Smith, presently holds the position at Sheldon Historical Society Board of Directors while hosting their website and their Facebook page. Over the past seven years, his research on the history of Sheldon has resulted in several media publications and public presentations through schools and local public access stations. Prior to his retirement over 15 years ago, so he's our age. He was talking about that, so I thought that was okay. Uh, he worked in computer technology and education at several levels. So I say to you, would you welcome Harold Smith back to the classroom? <laughs> My first disclaimer, except I'll say this, if there's any reason you can't hear me, say so. If there's any reason that you can't see the screen, move. <laughs> <laughs> I hated history. I hated history all the way through high school and all the way through college and bed to bear it. <laughs> As a New York resident, I had to take regents examinations, so I had to know it. I don't remember anything. Okay, so it wasn't until I turned 70 that I fell in love with history and I happened to be in Sheldon. So that's why I'm doing Sheldon history even though I live in St. Albans now. Uh, Don McFeeters and I both serve on the same board. We've known each other for years. <clears throat> My other uh, disclaimer is this looks like, very much like a pulpit. <clears throat> Because of choices like money and scholarships, my first year was spent in a very conservative Christian college where speech 101 was a requirement for freshmen. It wasn't speech 101, not at all. It was preaching preparedness 101. I failed. <laughs> you can see, I didn't want to stand behind this podium. It's okay, John, we got it back together. <laughs> I didn't want to stand behind the podium when there were people that were. Yeah. I'm good at that. So you see, there's my disclaimers. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I can break things in a minute, unless it's computers. <clears throat> so what we're talking about today, over about the next hour, questions, feel free. You're going to get one of three answers. I don't know. <laughs> or I'll tell you, or I'll say, that's later, that's slide 40, OK? You're not interrupting me. I'm used to a classroom, high school classroom. You were there. <laughs> Sheldon Poor Farm. How many people ever visited the Sheldon Poor Farm? There's one, OK? The Sheldon. Poor farm. I'm putting this one up as the first photo to show you. <clears throat> History is, in my imagination, a mixture of fact, boring fact, fiction, because people make up all kinds of stuff. But the essence of all of history is folklore. <laughs> what are the stories? I looked at this picture. This is a pretty classic picture from the Sheldon Poor Farm of the day, 1912. But well, what does it represent? I need to dig and to dig and to dig and to dig and to keep going down back in history and keep digging. This is a family portrait, courtesy of the Perry Farm, Perry family. Why would anybody go to the poor farm and take a picture of a bunch of people anyway? Somebody got hired to do this. <clears throat> take a look, if you will. This was a poor farm that was situated on Poor Farm Road. First one. The second poor farm. It's a brick building. Two stories. Anybody alive in 1912? <laughs> 20s, 30s. When did the first electricity come into Vermont? When was plumbing a big deal? We're going to get to a little bit of controversy a little later about the poor farm. 
But the fact of the matter is, is that the quality of utility and other things in the state of Vermont were not really very good until you get past the 60s. So I want to, I want to, I want to get a welcome here today again. My name is Poverty. You say, you can't be poverty. You don't look like poverty. You don't act like poverty. And you don't smell like poverty. But I am poverty. I'm not the poor. Over the essence of 300 years in this country alone and 3,000 years of history, you have poured billions of dollars into me. Of course I can dress like this. Poverty has cost you tons. And it'll probably cost you more. Poverty comes in a variety of different forms. Sometimes uh, it's compassionate. And sometimes it's very harsh. But so far, there's been no, I repeat, no cure, a long-term elimination of the causes of having to have places like poor farms. <clears throat> Go back in history, we'll go back a little further. Egypt, that's a long ways back, right? <laughs> what happened to people in Egypt who couldn't afford to, they became slaves. What happened in Babylonia? They became slaves. Poverty's not a new issue. Poverty in this country is just an iteration of poverty that has occurred across all of human history. <clears throat> there is a, saying that um, the poor were being punished. You know, if you, if you were poor and you're going to pay bills, I sent you to debtor's prison. Not highly likely that you're going to make enough money in debtor's prison to pay me back, is it? That was a good, not a good cure. <clears throat> Here's a group of women, typical of poor farm living, in a kitchen, getting ready to cook. Up here it says Shelby County, so it's a different place. It isn't the poor farm that I'm dealing with. And over here, poor kids playing in what looks to be a used trailer. Both of these pictures were in the 1940s. But we haven't always been averse to helping the poor. During the Elizabethan age, that was Queen Elizabeth I, we had this thing called compassion. And she didn't want the people in the British Empire to think that she wasn't compassionate toward the poor. So they started doing things like almshouses. Almshouses. <clears throat> Problem with Queen Elizabeth is you know how much money she put in their almshouses? Nothing. She professed to need compassion and spent nothing to do it. So, I mean, take a look at these poor people. <laughs> In this structure, here's a guy with a nice top hat. Um, they don't look as poor as some of the poor we've seen in other locations, but they're still the poor of being in Britain. We um, continued in England before we got to the United States to attempt to take care of the poor by grouping them in ways that we can identify them and give them quote unquote support. And that probably still continues. So let's uh, <clears throat> move over to America. 17, no, 16, okay. <clears throat> there were about 10 million indigenous people living in this country. According to history.com, the Northeast cultural area, one of the first to have any sustained contact with Europeans, <clears throat> stretched from Canada's Atlantic coast to North Carolina and inland to the Mississippi River. Its inhabitants were members of two main groups of Iroquois speaking, 
most of whom lived along inland rivers and lakes and fortified uh, politically stable villages, and most, the most numerous Algonquin speakers uh, who lived in small farming and villages along the ocean, they grew crops. In my attempt to determine things about taking care of the poor, I find no evidence that indigenous people had a poor population. Age and need were highly respected things. They were farmers. They tilled the ground. They were fishermen. They were able to sustain themselves and had more than enough abundance to share. But we don't read too much about it. <clears throat> But we got here in sixteen twenty two. The first poorhouse was set up in Jamestown, which is where the first settlement was, <clears throat> and then into uh, New England. And this was the Boston Alms House in sixteen sixty. Looks like a fortress to me. <laughs> I examined this in very close detail. If I'm a poor person being cared for by you, you're going to give me the minimum amount of space. So let's say that's it. 10 times 4 is 40, times 2 is 80, times 4 is 320 people living in this building. In the center section, there's a common area. Boston, 320 people in a poorhouse. That's pretty amazing to me. It's not what we read in the history books for sure. One of the famous things coming out of here was called the Workhouse Whale. One of the things that happened in workhouses is the women were over there and the men were over there. Women over here, 80% of the population. The men over here were about 20. How come? Widows. People who went to war and never came back. People who decided to go west and their wives didn't want to go with them. There were more women in poverty in the 1800s than men. Anybody here ever live in the poor farm? I've been in a couple of them. I didn't live there. Some people have. In this country alone, millions of the people that are related to you in the past at some time or another have been on the poor farm. One of, I'll get to one of the people here in a minute whose relative was an overseer of the poor. So we know a little bit about that. Does anybody know any famous people who were housed in a poor farm? There weren't any. No. Calamity Jane. She was housed in the Galton County poorhouse after becoming ill and having no money. Newspapers across the country wrote about it, and soon letters and checks from acquaintances poured in. She was given a good deal of money, but she said to have spent it rather quickly on whiskey. <laughs> Babe Ruth, we don't know that name. George Herman, <clears throat> Babe Ruth Jr., Baltimore, a cunning, ruthless young man in the ages of 13, 14, so poorly behaved doing things like drinking, <clears throat> chewing tobacco, spending his time in the dockyards, running away from and taunting local police. It got to be too much. So his parents decided to send him to the Catholic orphanage, which was 
St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys, <coughs> a poor farm, to straighten him out. Must be something happened. This next one might surprise you. Annie Sullivan. How many people know who she is? Yeah. She's the tutor of Helen Keller. Helen Keller. Okay. <clears throat> so Annie Sullivan was eight years old. Eight years old. When her mother died of tuberculosis, her father abandoned the children two years later because he didn't think he could raise them on his own. And she and her brother James were sent to a rundown and overcrowded almshouse in Twigsbury, Massachusetts. And look what she became. But for some people, the poor farm was not a downer that much. Do -do 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 -do. You know, this one, she's a real person, Annie Oakley, out west. At the age of nine, she was admitted to the Drake County Infirmary along with her sister, Sarah Allen. <laughs> According to her autobiography, she was put in care of the infirmary superintendent, Samuel Crawford Edgington, and his wife, Nancy, who taught her how to sew and decorate. Beginning in 1870, she was quote, bound out to a local family to help care for their infant son on the false promise of 50 cents a week. That's about $11. And an education, but you got neither one. Okay? The original couple really wanted someone who could cook, pump water, and carry from the well. It wasn't her. One of the funniest people you've ever laughed at in silent films is right here. A poor farm resident. He was only in London, not in this country. His father and mother were absent. His father was absent. His mother was struggling financially. And she sent him to a workhouse twice before he was nine. When he was 14, his mother was admitted to a <clears throat> mental asylum. It's in this context that something comes about where somebody says that we need an almhouse, we need a way to care for the poor, we need to be able to do something, and then a politician got involved. And his name is Benjamin Franklin. And he said, there's no country in the world in which the poor are more idle, desolate, drunken, or insolent. The day you passed the act, you took away before their eyes the greatest of all inducements to industry, <clears throat> frugality, and sobriety by giving them a dependence on something else than a carefully accumulated during youth and health support and age and sickness. This is the guy who said a penny served, a penny, penny saved, a penny, the whole thing, okay? <clears throat> we were, he was aware of what was happening. <clears throat> this is a, uh, not a photo. This is one of the block scats. It's a, it's a pretty good representation of how the poor lived. Of course, my comment is that in 1800, except for the fact that it's overcrowded, that's not really a horrible living condition. I can't even begin to think about what it was like to live in the 1800s. Here it says payment in advance. It's a rare situation where you got men and women together in the same place. Not they're sleeping on the floor. <clears throat> These are poor people. <clears throat> this is the poor house. This is a women's section of a poor house. And again, this is not a photograph, but an etch. <clears throat> they're doing, this is what people would do. They'd work, find time to do some things. But for the most part, they were doing almost nothing. This was a pretty idle community. But we said, we got to do something. We got to do something. Along came the idea called outdoor relief. Interesting comment. <clears throat> it was provided through an overseer of the poor. 
So when people fell into hard times, members of their family or members of their church and congregation couldn't continue to provide enough assistance to them, they went, they made an application to an elected official called the overseer of the poor <clears throat> with a budget of tax money, we'll get there in a minute, he might provide them with food, fuel, clothing, or even, even, even permission to get medical treatment to be paid for by tax funds. <clears throat> I was on for a relief. The other one was called auctioning off the poor. Some people like auctions. Highest bidder gets it, right? No, the lowest bidder gets it. The lowest bidder got to buy you a poor person to work for them, I would say slave for them, <clears throat> for enough time to finally pay off that debt that sent you to prison. It was a public auction. Not a whole lot unlike slave auctions, except people weren't bound. But they were examined, okay? I certainly don't want somebody that isn't physically fit to come on my farm. <clears throat> I need somebody, so that was all there. The contract was to use the labor of the poor in return for feeding, clothing, housing, and providing health care. This was actually, actually a form of indentured servitude. Slavery. Contracting with someone in town. <clears throat> that was done here in Vermont even, other places. I would say to you, I got this person that needs to be taken care of. Will you do it? And you say, we bargain for a price. It's not an auction like the other one. Now you got a little bit of a picture about poverty, 1800. You got a little picture about the United States, about Europe, where you haven't even got the, I haven't got the Sheldon yet, it's the groundwork. <clears throat> but one of the interesting contrasts, if you will, or oxymorons for me, looking at poverty, is this statue. What does it say at the base of the statue? It says, give me your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me, and I will lift up my lamp beside the golden door. <clears throat> we were inviting immigrants. One of the first influxes of really poor people were the Irish. How come they came here? They had a potato famine. They was either go over here or starve to death. And so they came over here. They didn't starve to death. They got put into indentured servitude. Anybody Irish? You built the Erie Canal. You built the Black River Canal. That's two of the things I know that the Irish did. <clears throat> but here's this statue in New York Harbor saying, come, 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 come. And what's being said now, well, what's being said then and it's still being said now is, no, 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 no. Don't come, 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 come. We really don't want, 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 want you. Because we can't understand that to take care of you. It's been going on for a long time. So let's go to Vermont. <clears throat> We're getting closer to home. It was in 1791 that Vermont became a state. Hooray, hooray. And let's see, we were in Windsor, our capital, I believe. In 1797, we got to start at the top. The federal government cared nothing about supporting social issues. They were a government. Their main purpose was to protect us from our enemies and to help support us as we attempted to grow into a nation. It's not support. So they cast that off to the state. <clears throat> well, that's good, okay? The states were fine. So Vermont passed the law in 1797 saying, well, we're not going to take care of the poor. 
you are. And they cast it down to the towns. And they gave towns <coughs> in the 1797 legislation two things to help. One was called a poor tax. Anybody ever pay a poor tax? Your ancestors did. Everybody who owned land, does this sound familiar, got taxed. They're still doing it to us today. <laughs> they need money, they tax us, the landowners. So we had a poor, there was a big amount of money, maybe half a percent. <coughs> there was enough money so that the overseer of the poor had something to work with. Um, they gave us the ability to keep people out of town. That's still prevalent in some places. You can't be here. <coughs> I'm part of the Sheldon Historical Society, and my first apology going through the door was, I'm sorry, I've only lived here for 42 years. I'm not a native. <laughs> that sounds familiar. It should. The towns in their form of government that we still run today got vested with needing to elect someone in the town to become the overseer of the poor. New position, required money, tax money. So off it goes. <clears throat> and I know that there's somebody here named Newton. <coughs> John Newton and Dumberston, Republican, born in Stockbridge, farmer, received a common school education at Enfield, New Hampshire, a member of the 3rd Regiment, Vermont, held a position as selectman, town agent, and is now overseer of the poor. I don't know anybody by the name of Newton, so. <laughs> the system worked like this. If you needed it, you could request help. The overseer of the poor would help you. But the overseer of the poor is also responsible for overseeing. <coughs> so depending upon the size of the town, he had a number of people whose lives he had to intermingle with enough to know whether or not they needed help. I don't want that job. Okay. And if they were, the overseer of the poor was vested with the necessity to provide them with care within the means of what the town was providing. Most history says <coughs> the most economical means. Was in other words, it's only five letters long as it's cheap. The honest historians say to you that we established institutions to care for the poor the cheapest way possible. And as much as possible, get them out of town, somewhere. We don't want to see them, we don't want to hear them, we don't want to know about them, we're paying taxes. <clears throat> the Vermont Historical Society has a tremendous amount of resources on poor farms in Vermont. <clears throat> Establishing towns as an alternative to selling to the poor. Uh, it was never intended to be a perfect system. Good thing, because it wasn't. Failure to care for a growing underclass. My God, that sounds a lot like Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Not that I'm going to say anything. <clears throat> well, let's go to Sheldon. Sheldon Poor Farm. From 1833 to 1846 was not the one that people remember seeing. Because it was located here, and let me take you here, St. Albans to Swanton, <coughs> going over, if I can get my finger in the right place. Do do do, this is the St. Albans Road, this is Woods Hill Road, this is the Cook Road the old Cook Road. Okay, it was still in the town of Sheldon, in District 7, up the Cook Road to the Hield Road. At that intersection right there, you could go into Highgate, <clears throat> you could go into Swanton, 
And you can go into St. Albans. And those were the ones that, Franklin. Right here was Mrs. Webster's school. We know pretty much exactly where that was, although it's not been dug up. Down here, about 100 yards, was a house, a farm, that the board of directors for the quote-unquote Sheldon Poor Farm, no, Franklin County Poor Farm, bought this property. <clears throat> and they stayed here until 1846. The whole purpose, according to Over the Hill, which you're free to take a look at, which was a well-written book for this period of time, house persons, house persons who were unable to care for themselves, housing, so they bought a farm. Why a farm? You can work on a farm to help for your own good. Maybe. Maybe not. There's enough people working, and indeed in the Sheldon Poor Farm, when enough people were working, it was a profitable enterprise. But communal efforts of this nature have always failed. Always. Anybody know of any communes that have been successful? <clears throat> the Russians tried it, <clears throat> didn't they? Cotton farm, put everybody in the farm, let them go to work. That didn't work. People need the ability to be individuals, to achieve for themselves. They can't do things in community forever, meaning from sun up to sundown and all through the night. So all of these efforts of this kind of nature didn't work. We know <coughs> that right about there, this is the Beers map from 1870-something. Um, we know where it was. I've talked to a young lady who now lives in Oregon about her experience in living on the Cook Road and her father wanting to make an addition to the house and digging to build a new part of the house and finding bricks and bones. Poor farm. The cemetery in the poor farm. They didn't need a cemetery because right here, doo -doo -doo -doo, just past the intersection of the Hailed Road, if you've never been there and seen it, <clears throat> there is a cemetery. It's not very big. Uh, I don't even think maybe 40, 50 stones at most. There's a bunch of people in there named Webster. And there's also a bunch of people in there who came from the original poor farm. So there's cemeteries here. Now I know that <clears throat> because it seems to me like when people go to the website and they look at, they see cemetery, they send me out a letter, an email, say, well, I think my great, 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 great grandfather is buried in the cemetery. And you find out. I can send back a little note that says, well, here's find a grave. You find it there quicker than I can. <clears throat> because people are curious about that. But the grave was there. But while I still got this map up, just right here, do you do if you can still see it going all the way through? That's the old railroad. It's still there, by the way. I say old railroad is now the rail trail. <clears throat> it's also the Sweet Hollow Road. If you were here, the Olmsted Vault, you would be in the current Sheldon Springs. Looking down here, do 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 here. No, I don't want to go up there. That's the nudist colony. Let me take a turn here. <laughs> take a little turn right here. Right here is the second Sheldon Poor Farm. And it's right on the end of what it's called. What is it called? Poor Farm Road. That becomes important <clears throat> in as much as <clears throat> when we're in District 7 and the location, I got the people, they're all Websters. <clears throat> they're all related. They all got a little profit from the sale of property. They have a cemetery. They have a school. They have a good life for that period of time that the poor farm was there. 
they enjoyed peace and peacefulness, okay? They didn't have any problems. Now we move it because it was a fire. And we moved it to what is now known as the Poor Farm Road, about 150 acres there, plus, 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 if you want the deeds, if you want the devil's details, they're at the town clerk's office. This one, that one, and the next one. <coughs> they set up a poor farm at that location, which was a farm. But it wasn't an easy place to be. Okay, here are some of the things that were happening in the Sheldon Poor Farm. It wasn't the Sheldon Poor Farm. We tried calling it the Franklin County Poor Farm. Franklin County was not a government entity of any kind whatsoever that could be recognized. They weren't all from Sh they weren't all of Franklin County involved. So some of the towns said, no, 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 no. Fairfax is not sending people over. But you're not Franklin County, so they changed it to something called the Asylum for the Poor. <clears throat> that didn't work out too well until about 19, I think it was 19, when they finally wrote up the bylaws. And they officially adopted the name the Sheldon Poor Farm because it was located in Sheldon. Sheldon didn't own it. Sheldon didn't have a whole lot to do with it. And so the question came up as, who pays the taxes? Who can pay the taxes? Why is it important? How much is going to be paid? The importance of this particular argument is right here. I didn't bring them with me because I am not allowed to. <clears throat> Those are the original affidavits, arguments, and counter-arguments occurring between 1887 and 1890 in this argument over the poor farm and taxes. And it is replete with consistent history about what was happening up to that point in time. These documents that are right here that are in the Sheldon Historical Society's Museum right now <clears throat> tell a story from sworn affidavits. Now, I agree with you, they might not be the whole truth. They might be some fiction, and there might be some folklore, but the essence of the poor farm up until 1887 is pretty much covered here. So to that extent, that was a really good thing. 1893, this is not the original. We'll get back to this photo in a minute. In 1893, on the poor farm road, the original barn burned. Oh, wait a minute, this is a farm. What happens when a barn burns on a farm? <clears throat> they sold the cows, they attempted to recover, and in their attempts to recover, things got a little messy until at one point in time, in 1897, there was an article written in the <clears throat> St. Albans Messenger. Well, I don't have the original, because if you look at this, you're free to do it. <clears throat> it's in such poor condition, I can't even get it out of the file. But two reporters went to the poor farm and visited. And they said, oh my god, it's a, 63 miserable human beings are here. It's partly being supported by Berkshire, Enosburg, Fairfield, Franklin, Highgate, Shelton, St. Albans, and Swanton. 20 children are growing up in this miserable condition. The words, the expletives are the words of people who are very good writers. Feel free to read it. This one over here is the second follow-up by uh, George Holmes. And This one here says, the Sheldon Poor Farm, rotten, dirty, says welfare officials in a report from the Welfare Department. What prompted all that? Why would the St. Albans messenger go on to the poor farm? The same as why would anybody else go on to the poor farm to take a picture, a portrait of the family? Immediately before this article <coughs> appeared, 
in the St. Albans Daily Messenger, a similar article appeared in the Barry Times Herald about the state insane asylum in Waterbury. And they literally cut it up, and because they did, circulation went up. They got more famous, and people who wrote the article got to be known. And lo and behold, within six months, somebody decided how about some fame. But I ask you again, 1897, what do you think the sanitation conditions were in a big, big, big house full of people? I doubt that any amount of effort would have made it satisfactory for people to come in and look at it. Now we come up with this thing called schools and children. This is not <coughs> the school in question. They come find a picture. Frankly, it's in there in that archive of pictures someplace. The Sheldon Springs School has a freight train in front of it. It was part of uh, it was back in behind the uh, Sheldon Mill when the train went straight through there. So the picture that was taken, one of the pictures taken, has a train in it. There was a legal battle about schools and children. There was never a question about schools when they were in the Webster District. But the minute they got to the Sheldon Springs District, the question was, who is going to pay the tuition? So there was a battle. Went to court. Took a while, a year. The Franklin County Supreme Court ruling in St. Albans was <clears throat> that, consistent with Vermont law, all children under a certain age would be educated in the town where they lived. And the kids ended up going. I've read horror stories about that. Okay, People, teachers, teachers in the school say, we don't really want these dirty people. Every September, or whenever it was, <clears throat> they would wash these kids up, comb their hair, and send them to us. Because they look, but, but for very long, <clears throat> we really didn't want them. They didn't want them. Why, if you, why, why don't you build a school up there on the hill, educate them? So the issue of children became paramount, okay? <clears throat> but there's still another bigger issue here. that arises at approximately the same time, and that is... Excuse me, the boys at the poor farm probably really wasn't a very good place for children. I think I would agree. Children being raised in a poor farm in poverty with a community of people who are poor are going to develop a poor mentality. They can't help it. So children should be cared for in their own homes. Well, wait a minute, their parents are living in the poor farm. So the first attempt to alleviate some of that was to make sure that people with children maintained their own home. The kids stayed at home with them. I get paid five dollars a month. Whoa, five bucks a month to keep your kid out of the poor farm. Wait a minute, I'm going to have 10 kids. <laughs> Does this sound familiar? This is, I mean, we say this today because we've got single mothers who have another child and another child. <clears throat> there was one person who had 10 kids. He got paid more to keep him home at $5 a month than it would have cost to keep him at the poor farm. And the other place was to pay private homes three bucks. To keep them in foster-type situations. Towns paid 
money to the association to support a poor farm. Here's the income. Over here, there's the expense. Well, wait a minute. Hannesburg, we're giving you $387 a year for kids at home, but you're only paying $292 to the association, so you're making money off us. <coughs> and it happened. It happened. So within this context of the Sheldon poor farm, there was lots of fiction, lots of friction between towns, among other things. 1913, there was a fire. This is the same one I showed you earlier. 1913, there was a fire. This insane inmate set fire upstairs. It's a brick building, but it burned to the ground. And they started a new building in June, on the 13th, which was completed in December. So the Sheldon Home Association, which is what they got to be called by now, <clears throat> had accumulated enough funding and equity to be able to rebuild. The counter courier of all things is one of the better articles about this particular time. It's got a lot of information in it. Uh, not only here, but on the back. Okay. <coughs> the other, this one was written by a, a woman called Susan Trespiz in 1997. There are two very excellent articles. That one, and the next one I'll show you in a minute. Um, it got completed. And voila, here it is. People, at least one person in this audience, had seen this. I haven't, I never saw it. I've stood here and looked, not seen much. It was a three-story building. I got a better picture of it in a minute. <clears throat> 151 by 40. In that period of time, it housed 125 people. Cost thirty thousand dollars. That's the poor farm that most of us have heard about, have any familiarity with, because this was the last, if you will, iteration of the housing. Because of the, it was a fire in 1927, and again, the farm, the barn burned down, not the house, you know, place to house the cows, they sold them, they build a new barn, cost money. All the time it's costing money, we're not making any money. There's no farm products going out. If you read down through some of the lists of the farm products and it's boring stuff, boring stuff, 40 cows, 87 sheep, 127 pounds of butter, all that kind of stuff was kept track of. And it's available to you. They built a new barn in 1929 and brought in a herd of Eshar. Now I'm gonna move you up to 1929. It's a very quick move. You know, there wasn't a lot, there really wasn't a whole lot said about what was going on in the poor farm over a period of time, but something that was there. People visited, people lived next door. A friend of mine dated the son of a caretaker who was actually in the barn and she's still around today. <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Ray Stanley Enosburg, I believe, <clears throat> were given for their efforts over the last seven years to brighten the lives of unfortunate people who are confined in this institution. They were there from 1929 till 1946. That is a long time to be overseer, matron, and so they got some special recognition, but the most recognizable person is right here. 1947, 
It's probably a birth year for a few of us sitting in this room. Okay, until 1968. This woman, who you can read more about here, and her husband were the caretakers and matron of the Sheldon Poor Farm. Now, when I posted Sheldon Poor Farm <clears throat> on Facebook, I got a whole bunch of replies from people related to this person who still live in Enosburg and Richford. Had the poor farm had this kind of person going through its entire history, it would have probably been a better experience for most. She was a highly regarded and well-respected person, and her husband was a great manager <coughs> of the poor farm. And then the barns. So that's there for anyone to take a look at. <coughs> Caring for our own, okay? This is some of her story. This is some of the barns. This is <clears throat> the house itself, the biggest house. This is the barns behind it. <coughs> Towns of Berkshire, Enosburg, Shell, and Swan, Fairfield, St. Albans Town. Um, St. Albans Town and St. Albans City were co-joined for the biggest share of his time until they separated. Um, the other really good article is by Susan talks about the best and the worst of humanity and a decline of the poor farm over time. <clears throat> the reason I have this one in as you can see the poor farm in the back right here. There's a farmer. There's a stone wall. You can buy it. A couple thousand dollars. Original Coca-Cola, oh, supposed original. Talk about scams, okay? Don't buy it. The original's hanging in Sheldon. The one that's out on the internet is a scam. Okay, you can, they can reproduce as many times as you want to. This is pretty significantly talking about what it's like to be a farmer at the poor farm. At the end, or is it? <clears throat> I'm going to be done in a minute. The last American poor farm <clears throat> closed in the 1960s, <clears throat> 25 years after Congress had passed the Social Security Act of 1935. Federal government finally decided to get involved. Provided American <clears throat> indigent and elderly citizens uh, provided for health care services, et cetera, et cetera, still around today. <clears throat> Prior to Social Security, there were 150,000 poor homes in America. And by 1950, most of them were gone. <clears throat> the reason for the decline of the poor farm, to some extent, was the uprising of humanitarian kind of support. Okay, it's still here today. Do you realize that providing support for the homeless, the hungry, the children, the indigents, the criminals is a multi-billion dollar business today. Think about it. That's what took the place of the poor farm. <clears throat> so we really haven't achieved an end to a poor farm. We went from the poor farm and the farm, farm, farm to a, isolated, to a silo situation, <clears throat> elderly housing, Let's say in asylums, better hospitals. So there are 554,000 homeless people living in America at the last census, 2.2 million in jails. <clears throat> we have some for-profit nursing homes of questionable reputation. And we're still struggling with the political, economic, and social issues that 
It's around poverty. And there's even been word that maybe we need to reopen the poor farm if you want to. <laughs> but that's really what happened in Vermont during poor farm year. If you have any questions, you didn't during the. I, I found out when I was doing genealogy on my family yeah. uh, their second great grandparents in the 1860 census, it said I found them in the poor farm. Mm -hmm. But it turns out he was working there. I can't quite read the first. There's two, two uh, words to describe his position. Something or other laborer. Yeah. Um, and they were listed under the superintendent of the, the poor farm and the family of that. Right. And this, the, the great grandmother was there too because they had just married that year. The next census I found them on a farm in Montgomery. Okay. But <clears throat> running down the side of the census record, it says the Sheldon Poor Farm, and including Berkshire, Enosburg, Fairfield, Franklin, Highgate, Sheldon, St. Albans, and Swanton. So right. that, that's where all of the people who lived there at that time were from. That number of towns changed annually. Right. Annual contract for the towns to house their poor right. This was the yeah. they, were, they were in the different, <laughs> different numbers of towns at different years. Because maybe sometimes it wasn't the poor, well, maybe it wasn't the cheapest way to do it. Huh? If, you, if you go down the old Mill River Road and, uh, in Georgia, mm -hmm. there's a beautiful big stone uh, farmhouse. That was, according to the Georgia historical book, the Georgia Poor Farm. I mean, you would never guess it today. I mean, you look at this beautiful stone farmhouse and you go, I, I passed it many, many times and it wasn't until I read the historical book that I went, oh, that was the Georgia Poor Farm. <laughs> and it's, the house is still there, <clears throat> privately owned now, of course. I remember seeing a poor farm in my youth riding around with my father in a, in a, in a Chevy, <coughs> and him saying, well, that's the poor farm, so if you don't go over and work your ass off, that's where you're gonna end up, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a pretty common saying. People, there was quotations in, in, in yeah. history about, I would rather be anywhere than at the poor farm. I've learned that, that my grandfather was the overseer of the poor in Brattleboro. Brattleboro. In 18, it could have been 1880s, I think, somewhere mm -hmm. in there. Every town had to elect an overseer of the poor and pay him. And they had to have a town poor tax because the federal government didn't want to do it. The state <coughs> government certainly wasn't going to become involved. And they cast it off to the towns because the independent towns are good governing agencies, if you will. But then the towns decided that, my God, I can't take this on alone. So they got together and this county, this is county is unique. Oh, by the way, in case you want to know, 1968, it closed. Last month. So we know of in the country, it closed. Mrs. Nolan did not walk out of the door of the poor farm until closing time on that date, stipulated by law to be the last date that anyone in the country would be allowed to run a poor farm. She took six people with her to her place in Richmond. The rest of them had gone to other places. The last one, last minute, last time. Pretty dedicated woman. Her children, <coughs> grandchildren, excuse me, have some pretty marvelous things to say about her. Other questions? Well, I'm really curious about what, what, <coughs> what a day in the poor farm would really look like, you know, in just terms of. We thought that pretty much that would depend upon your ability. Uh, in the one case that I read about a woman who was in the poor farm in the bed for a full three years from the time she got there to the time she died because she wasn't able to do anything. She probably would have been better off any place but the poor farm. Um, and yet, in other situations, the poor farm in Sheldon made money because the routine would have been a farm. I mean, what did you do if you were a farmer? 
You got up in the morning, milk cows, you took care of chores, you tilled the land, you saw the guy in the field, <clears throat> you harvested crops, you made cheese. Well, I would think that, you know, what they were able to do, you know, um, in the country of the poor farm, with the barn, with, you know, animals, they, they, you know, my idea is that they, you know, had that opportunity, you know, to be self-sustaining. They could, you know, they could garden and they could take care of their animals and they could feed the people living there. Now, I, you know, in, in my mind today, I think, you know, with that poor farm setting be any worse than what we deal with here in this new millennium, where, you know, there are just high numbers of homeless people. And even though I, I really believe that, you know, as Vermonters, we certainly do our very best, you know, to feed our homeless, to shelter them. But can you, when I think about, like, sometimes the expense of housing, you know, um, our homeless, you know, in, in um, uh, older hotels and motels, you know, I, I, you know, I just, like, it, it's, a, it's a quandrum which has evaded us for many thousand years. And when I think about the question that you're asking, I think about myself and I say, why didn't you end up in a poor house? My mother was a widow when I was 13 and there were six of us. It was like six months before Social Security finally came through and paid money. <clears throat> we were living in a house that we moved into an apartment because my brother-in-law sold the house, we moved into an apartment, it was a cold water flat. Why didn't I end up there? Because of something instilled within me that drove by the poor farm and my father said, if you don't get your ass busy, boy, you're going to end up right here. Because the raising, the raising of children, not education. Well, I don't know how to explain it, but the raising of children, each of you was raised by a parent or parents or foster parents or aunts and uncles, somebody who instilled within you the idea that you needed to take care of yourself. But that's not true of most of the people who ended up in this poor farm. What we've created, I'll go back to Bernie again. I like Bernie, and I voted for him, but I gotta tell you this, the more I look at this situation and other situations, <clears throat> we have an opportunity to provide support to people. We do it through Social Security, which I paid for over the time of when I was working, so I, I should have it. But I have no other, not this word, entitlements. If I went back to Benjamin Franklin's quote, I'd have to tear it apart and put entitlements in, not this damn law. When people become having the feeling and pass on to their next generation the feeling that I am entitled to this, it's going to be here forever. How do you break that? I don't know. <laughs> you don't break it with a poor farm. If poor farms were voluntary basis, <laughs> they would still be in existence today. But as I said, communal living, communal farms were tried many, 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 they work. So the poor farm worked as well as any. When did it work its best? 1929 till 1968, and why? Two people, and two people, Stanleys and Nolans, were people who, excuse my French, really gave a shit. Okay, that's, that's the reason it was successful then. What is the relationship of the Warner home to the poor, farms, poor farm system? The Warner farm was a, was a uh, orphanage, and when the controversy arose about children staying in a poor farm, those who could not be returned to parents or relatives to take care of them <clears throat> were sent to the Warner home. So the Warner home was an orphanage at the side. I went to school with a number of children from, because I lived right by Messenger right. Street School and they were just up. So, mm -hmm. so, so quite a few of them came to our school. 
But it wasn't really an orphanage. I mean, they, those, those children were wards of the state. So it wasn't like they were put up for adoption. No. Um, the service during, uh, uh, would pay for children to be housed there when their parents or father were, were uh, deployed. Um, there were people who, kids who were there temporarily while parents were moving um, or getting back on their feet. I don't know of any adoptions. But when Chauncey Warner um, endowed the orphanage, it was for little wanderers <laughs> and yeah, people who, who needed either consistent housing or temporary housing. And it was all children. Yes. I went there uh, quite, a, quite a long time ago and uh, I didn't really make a study of it, but I found a cemetery and I couldn't find stone there. There were all flat stones up on the ground, probably this big, where the age of the deceased was over 53 years old. Uh, yeah, so I when people that were dying that. there. Uh, it wasn't the best environment in the general public. Living. Um, the Vermont Old Cemetery Association, who oh, well, the guy I communicate with is out of Manchester. Uh, he's been up twice. He's coming up to give the spring to <clears throat> start to think about reclaiming that cemetery so we can get more ideas about what's there. Father Bouchard was the last one who did an extensive amount of work in the cemetery, and I've avoided the cemetery in my, in my presentation completely because this is a completely different topic. Um, there's a lot of great stuff. There. A lot of people lived and died. There were people who were born, lived and died at the shelter. Oh, are there Here's the unfortunate part about records. Who was responsible for the individual who was at the forefront? Who? The top. Overseer. So who kept the records? Not the forefront. The forefront kept records of <coughs> income, <coughs> production, numbers, that kind of stuff. They didn't really keep the individual records. I'm just curious, uh, these uh, buildings that mysteriously burnt at the Sheldon Poor Farm, were any of these buildings insured? <laughs> yeah. So I used to pay a little bit. Yeah, the uh, second house was paid for. The second barn was paid for by insurance from the first I mean, the, when it became a responsibility of the board of directors, they surely had insurance. Okay, thank you. One little aside for you, maybe two, one for sure. I don't want to keep you, I wouldn't want to eat, right? Um, after the poor farm left, 1968, this place was bought, the property was bought by Homer Nurkey. And he's the one that still, I don't know, I think he may or may not be alive. I know Homer pretty well. Um, he rented it out to Treadwell, Treadway, something. It was uh, housing for disturbed young men. And they were, it was a big enough place that they could care for them there before it burned. <laughs> and they had a bunch of, mm, you know, semi delinquent, almost criminal young men living there. 1975. I owned a 1967 red Chevy Camaro two-door coupe. <laughs> I can still see it. I lived in Amosburg on the corner of Runaway and Tyler Branch Road. Worked in Berlin, he came home, parked the car. My wife's car, of course, is in the garage. I get up in the morning, no car. Three days later, I drive it back from Springfield the well, rear end is completely tore out of it, where these escapees from Treadwell, or whatever it was called, from that, that came up from Sheldon to Enosburg along the back road of Tyler Branch area and stole my car. 
and proceeded to take it over, Mount Mansfield and a few other places ended up in Millbury where a priest gave them enough money to buy gas to go back over the mountain. And they got to Springfield, they were arrested. It's a small world, huh? <laughs> if there's anything that I've hopefully have learned over time, <clears throat> I'm trying to make this short, is these are not the cures. Okay? These are not the cures for social ills, for poverty, for the rest of it. It reminds me of the story of the old man who had a shack on the beach. Right next to an alcove where there was a rich young man who had a big house. And the old man would get up every day at sunrise and he'd walk the beach. And every once in a while, the rich kid would see it. He watched him, he'd get on the beach a little bit and he'd pick up something and throw in the ocean. That's pretty strange behavior. You do that all day, he wonders. A little further, he bends over, he picks something up. He throws it in the ocean. Well, one day there was one hell of a tropical storm. <clears throat> the poor man, the guy in the shack got up and he looked up the beach and it was littered. And the rich guy got up and he looked and he said, oh my God, look at all of that. Well, here's the old man going to the beach. Bent down, pick up, throw it in. The rich man saw it and he said, well, that's a starfish for God's sakes. There are thousands of them out here. Got blown up on the storm overnight onto the old man. He says, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm saving starfish. He bent over and he picked it up and threw it in. And the rich man says to him, the kid says to him, you can't possibly save them all. Why would you do this? He bent over and he picked up another one. He threw it in the ocean. He says, this one counts. How many people have ever engaged with one individual, one individual, to give them <coughs> financial support, I'm thinking more than anything. Ever have a homeless person come to town needing housing and spend $150, $200 to put them up in a motel where they can get a shower while they're showering and go to Walmart and get them some clothes? Did you ever do that? Did you ever have a <coughs> single mom? His family ran out of fuel, and the fuel company wouldn't give him any more until he paid the bill, which was next week when the check came. Well, my friend, is 30 below. Did you spend a couple hundred dollars putting fuel in their tank and fighting with the company that supplies them about, this is my purchase, not theirs. You put it in that tank, that's what I wanted. And oh, by the way, if you don't want to, don't put it in my tank either. Okay. <clears throat> Have you ever seen a kid on the street who needed someone to sit down and talk with? How do you solve poverty? How do you solve social ills? How do you solve all that? It's called one starfish at a time. <laughs>